you come and be darling. I've got the special for me today. Have just the thing. Oh, she's a fine woman, there's no doubt. Oh my God, look at that. You have a fine, steady hand. Slunch me, darling, slunch her. Great stuff. Gentlemen, it's star time. Jury's Hotel proudly present Ireland's international comedian. Yes, it's himself, Hal Roach. Thank you very much indeed, thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Dublin, welcome to Juries, and welcome to the Emerald Isle. To all our Irish friends in the audience, a big welcome to you also. Irish humour is so beautifully unpretentious that people love it all over the world for that very reason. Ireland was always conscious of the need to laugh. That's true, and tonight we're going to prove that. This fellow Doolan is dashing to catch the ferry boat in Dublin. When he got to the quayside, the ferry boat is about 20 feet out from the dock, but he decided to take a chance. He went back, he took a run, and he jumped 20 feet over the water, and he landed on the deck. And he said to the deckhand, my God, I just made it. And the deckhand said, you shouldn't have bothered, this boat is coming in. <laughs> 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 write it down, write it down, good one. We're enjoying ourselves, that's right. I went for a jacuzzi, have you heard of jacuzzis, by the way? Jacuzzis, you did? Yeah, 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 we have one. Yeah, we have one now in Dublin, a jacuzzi. I decided to have a jacuzzi today. I went to this place. When I got there, it was all steam, white tires and steam everywhere. So I took all my clothes off, and when the steam cleared, I was in a fish and chip shop. <laughs> don't think about that, for God's sake. Don't think about it. <laughs> Flanagan and the wife were married 15 years, and God had not blessed them with children, which was a great source of sadness to them. But they accepted the will of God and life goes on as it does. You're late. <laughs> I, uh... <laughs> we can cut that bit out. We're all right, okay. Yeah, life goes on. I mean, no, no family, by the way, Flanagan. Married 25 years and no children, but they accepted that, and life goes on as it does. Now, Father O'Brien is a friend of the family, and he calls to the house, by the way. He was transferred from Ireland to Rome, and he calls to the house to say goodbye and to commiserate with them that God had not blessed them with children. But he said, don't worry, when I get to St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, I shall light an everlasting candle for your intentions to have a family. Fifteen years go by and the priest came home on a holiday, called to the house to see how they were getting on. By that time, the wife had six sets of twins, five separate children, and the husband missing. And the priest said, where is the man of the house? She's getting, she said, he's gone to Rome to blow out the candle. He's gone. <laughs> You're very nice, you really are. You're very, very nice. Up at the pearly gates of heaven, there are two big marquee signs. And written on one sign, it says, and I quote, Stand here, all the men who are henpecked by their wives on earth. Thousands of men standing beside it. Another big sign, it says, and I quote, Stand here, all the men who are not henpecked by their wives on earth. There's one little fellow, O'Brien, standing there on his own. Hmm. So Peter said, O'Brien, why are you standing there on your own? He said, my wife told me to stand here. <laughs> I tell you. I mean... <laughs> Laugh at us, sir. You probably, by the way, passed the taxi rank outside the hotel juries as you came in this evening. Now, there's one taxi man out there. His name is Flanagan. People love this man. They stand in line to ride in his cab. Do you know why they love him? Well, I'll tell you why they love him. Because he makes them laugh. You know, God gives people a very special gift when he gives them the ability to make people laugh. And that's true. It's a great gift. And he's got it. He's got it. The charisma, he's got it all. I heard last week he had five American ladies in the back of his cab and they were discussing men they had met all over the world. 
And one lady said, we reckon categorically that the Irishmen are the third greatest romantic lovers in the world. And we reckon the first and second are the Jewish men and the cowboys. He said, what's your name? And he said, hop along Goldberg. <laughs> He's terrific. They love this man, I tell you, they love him. Do you know what he said to me last week? He said, what do you call, what do you call a woman who knows where her husband is every night? I said, what? He said, a widow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I wish I could be out there with you listening to this. <laughs> That's fantastic stuff, it really is. Now, we've got a lot of class in the audience now. We really do. There's a lovely lady down here. Now, I know that you appreciate class by the way you're looking at me. I can tell, I can tell. I want you to look at this diamond I am wearing and tell me what you think of that. Isn't it beautiful? Now, the story behind that is very interesting. It concerns my mother-in-law. Now, there was a woman drummed out of the Gestapo for cruelty. <laughs> yes, gone now, passed on, deceased. At least I think she is. You can't trust them. You don't know for sure. Before she died, she called me to her bedside. She said, Hal, during my lifetime, I have amassed a great fortune. And when I'm dead, in remembrance of me, I want you to get a nice stone. Look at that thing. It's a beautiful job, isn't it? Fantastic. It really is, brother. Fantastic. Before she died, she used to say to me, if you will treat my daughter i claw my way out of the grave to hunt you. Well, I fixed that. I had a buried face downwards. <laughs> She's now on her way to Australia. <laughs> oh, they're in tonight, are they? All the Australians. Give them a big round of applause. Welcome. Good day. <laughs> oh, we love her. You know, talking about Australia, Casey and Flanagan went to the zoo, and there's a big cage and in the cage is a kangaroo cavorting around in the cage. And written on the cage, it says, and I quote, native of Australia. Casey got hysterical. He said to Flanagan, I don't believe it. He said, to think that my only sister married one of them. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down, good one. It really is. Murphy got a part in the play in the village. He had two words to say in the play, it is. That's all he had to say. That's right. And for three weeks before the play opened, he was going around the village rehearsing, talking to himself. It is. It is. It is. It is. On the night of the play, he walked onto the stage and he said, is it? <laughs> <laughs> A lot of people think, by the way, that the men from County Kerry here in Ireland are only 80 cents in the dollar. Don't you believe that? I was down on County Kerry on the beach, by the way. There's a fellow walking along the beach selling live seagulls for a pound each. I thought, I don't believe it. I went up to him. I said, uh, I gave him a pound. I said, I'll have a seagull. He took the money, looked up and said, that one up there is yours. <laughs> no, I mean to say, I tell you. You're lovely. I wish I could be out there with you listening to this. As I said, fantastic stuff, it really is. Now, this fellow Danaher. Dan Danaher is the caretaker of a little graveyard in County Kerry. Now, there's a storm the previous night, and the next day he's going around inspecting the uh, cemetery for damage, and he comes to Pat Murphy's grave, and the tombstone is blown over. He thinks, this isn't right, I've got to fix this. He went away to the work shed, came back with a coil of wire, put the stone back, wrapped the wire around the tombstone, took the wire away, tied it to a high tree, and the stone is now steady. And that evening, Casey and Flanagan are making a short cut home through the graveyard with a good few jars on them. And they see this thing. And Casey said to Flanagan, look at that. Now he said, Murphy is doing well. I see he's got the phone in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're lovely. You really are. Delightful. Deli can you hear me on the mantelpiece over there? You can. The rich people on the shelf. Do you know, when somebody dies in the hills of County Kerry, the ritual of the wake has not changed for a thousand years. My dear people, let me try and give you some idea what happens. 
in the little cottage in the mountain, the thatch cottage, they cover the kitchen table with a white sheet and a silk pillow. And they lay the remains out on the table and all the neighbours come in to pay their last respects. Such a man lying on the table as Seamus O'Shaughnessy, passed on, deceased, gone over demise, and stone dead as well. <laughs> suddenly, suddenly, O'Shaughnessy began, by the way, to slide off the table like that. Slide, 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 slide onto the floor. Like a ship and launch, like a ship and launched, he went down. And Rutherford said, in the name of God, what are we going to do? Flanagan said, we'll have, to, we'll have to level him up somehow. He said, we'll put his head on a chair, we'll put one at his feet, we'll push a chair in underneath him, lift him up and level him out. Muldoon said, a good idea. <laughs> but he said, leave it to me. He looked at the people in the wake and he said, can we have three chairs for the corpse? And they all went, hip, hip! <laughs> Hooray! This is true. Casey and the wife, by the way, were having their little problems in their marital bliss. He is a commercial traveller uh, from Dublin, and he's down in Cork. And he heard on the radio that he'd won £8 million on the lottery. So he phoned the wife. He said, £8 million. Terrific. Pack your bags. She said, shall I pack them for the summer or the winter? He said, it doesn't matter as long as you're gone when I get back. <laughs> Horse doping is very prevalent in the world today, is it not? Murphy had a horse running in the 2.30 race here in Dublin. Before the race was due to start, he was seen rather secretly to be slipping something into the horse's mouth. Watching him was the Duke of Bedford from London. The Duke said, Murphy, I saw that. It's against the law to give things to horses before races. And Murphy said, I only give the horse a lump of sugar, that's all. And he said, I'm having a lump of sugar myself. And he did. And he gave a lump of sugar to the Duke as well. And the Duke ate the sugar and went away, obviously satisfied with this explanation. And when he was gone, Murphy said to the jockey, you know, for the first couple of furlongs, keep a tight rein on her holder. And when you're round the bend to go into the straight, let that horse go. And he said, don't worry if anything passes you. It'll either be me or the Duke of Bedford. <laughs> Write it down. Good one. Doolin. You're very nice, you really are. <laughs> Doolan had a racehorse, by the way, the fastest racehorse in Ireland. Every race that Doolan had this horse entered for, it was always ten lengths ahead of all the other horses. There was only one problem. Every time the horse would get near the winning post, instead of passing it, just before it passed it, it would veer off to the right and run off that way. Yeah, he's gone out of his mind with this horse. He really is. He went to see Sullivan, the vet. He said, Sullivan, I have the fastest horse in Ireland. But every time he gets near the, win the winning post, instead of passing the damn thing, he veers off to the right, runs off that way, and the next horse comes along and wins. What am I going to do? And Sullivan said, I am familiar with that problem, <clears throat> and I have the solution for you. Uh, you must get a little lump of lead and put it in the horse's left ear. <laughs> and that should solve the problem. He said, how do I get a lump of lead in the horse's left ear? He said, with a gun. <laughs> Did you know that we had an Irish astronaut on the last shot to the moon? No, you didn't know that, did you? I am a great man for information. We had an Irish astronaut. His name was Finnegan. He was on the moon. He was incognito. Nobody knew. He didn't even know himself. He knew he was somewhere, but he didn't know he was on the moon. <laughs> Of course, you give five pints of Guinness to an Irish man, he'd go to the moon any time. <laughs> but let me tell you, he brought back 500 moon rocks to Dublin, and he sent them to all the universities in Ireland except Trinity College. He didn't like that, but I don't know why, so he didn't send them any. Of course, they didn't like that. So they sent him a scathing letter denouncing him publicly for not sending moon rocks to Trinity College. And they upset him. They upset him, and he wanted a bit of revenge. So what did he do? He went out to the farm, and he filled a container of what they called in Dallas, manure. <laughs> and he brought it back, and he mixed it with water and sand and pebbles and shaped the whole thing into look-alike moon rocks and sent them to Trinity College. There were six years trying to analyze this thing. <laughs> and eventually they wrote to him and said they had now established beyond all doubt that the cow did jump over the moon. <laughs> Yeah.
you're lovely. This fellow Murphy, by the way, hadn't been to confession for 25 years, and he decided to go. He went into the confession and he said, bless me, Father, it's 25 years since I was here before. The priest thought, my God, we're here for the night. <laughs> he said, get on with it. So he started off and after three hours he was still going strong. The priest was falling asleep listening to him. Honest to God. And eventually the priest was called away on a sick call, but Murphy didn't know he was gone. <laughs> and there he was with the head down, pegging away good hour. After five hours he finished. Looked up, couldn't see the priest. All he could see was the fella in the other side of the confessional. He says, where's the priest? And your man said, I don't know, but if you heard what I heard, he's gone for the police. <laughs> Write it down, it's a good one. <laughs> now, you've probably heard of County Wicklow, by the way, one of these lovely parts of Ireland. It's called the Garden of Ireland. Now, I was down there some time ago in Wicklow, and uh, I actually got lost. And I'd no watch either. I didn't know where I was. And I was lost. But I was lucky. There's a farmer in a field milking a cow. And he gave me the directions back to the village. I was very grateful. I said, thank you very much. And I said, by the way, would you have the correct time? And just then he said, yes. And he lifted the cow's udders high with his hands like that. He said, 20 past two. <laughs> I said, that's incredible. How can you tell the time by lifting the cow's udders like that? Well, he said, when I lift the cow's udders high enough, I can see the village clock. <laughs> I had your worry there for a while. I know I did. Some time ago, I was at O'Reilly's wedding. I remember being at O'Reilly's wedding about six months ago. Now, I don't think he'd remember being at his wedding. Stoned out of his mind, he was. Oh, yes, too much to drink. And after a while, the priest said to him, O'Reilly, you're drunk. He said, how do you know, Father? The priest said, you're lying on the floor. He said, I am, but I'm not hanging on. <laughs> and besides, Father, he said, the best man is drunker than me. And the priest said, you mean drunker than I. Well, he said, nobody's drunker than you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear God. Danaher came up from County Cork here to Dublin, by the way, and he tried to check into Jury's Hotel. And he said to the young lady at the, uh, in the lobby, I'd like a room for the night. She said, I'm sorry, but we're full. Now, he said, don't tell me that. I'm after driving all that way and I'm tired. I'd like to go to my bed. She said, I'm so sorry, Mika. We're full. But that's it. Now, he said, young lady, listen to me. If President Reagan were to walk in here right now looking for a room, what would you do? And the girl said, well, we'd have to find a room for him. Well, he said, he's not coming, so I'll have it. <laughs> we laugh at ourselves. Murphy and the wife, by the way, rented a little cottage down in County Kerry. Now, this cottage was in very bad repair, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was when the train would go by at 2 o'clock in the morning at 100 miles an hour on its way to Dublin, it used to vibrate the cottage like that so intensely as to knock himself and herself out of the bed in the middle of the night. That's true. The next day when the husband went to work, by the way, the wife sent for the landlord to complain. And the landlord came over to the cottage, walked in, the first thing he saw was a mouse trap on the floor with a fish flapping in it. Like that. He said, what's the fish doing in the mousetrap? The wife said, we'll talk about the dampness later. <laughs> she said, we can't stand it any longer. The house has fallen down. She said, every time the train goes by, the vibrations are so terrific that it knocks himself and myself out of the bed in the middle of the night. He said, surely to God, woman, you're exaggerating. She said, I'm not, and I'll prove it. There's a train coming now. Come with me and I'll show you. Now... I'm going to lie on the bed and you'll see for yourself. Now, she said, if you think I'm exaggerating, you just lie down there as well and experience the vibrations and the shake of when the train goes by. God knows to please the poor woman, didn't the landlord lie down on the bed as well? And just then the husband <laughs> walked in the door. He said, what's going on? And the landlord said, you're not going to believe it, but we're waiting for a train. <laughs> I know, I know, I wouldn't believe it either, I can tell you that. <laughs> this fellow Flanagan, by the way, is a bit of a hypochondriac, but he, had, he was incensed about staying young. He would do anything at all to stay young. And he saw in the newspaper pills 
to make you 50 years younger. So he sent for them and they sent him five. And they arrived, by the way. And when they arrived at his home, he forgot all about them and went his way. Now, a year later, he went to America. He went to America, by the way, for a year. And then he phoned to say that he was coming back and to meet him at the little railway station in the village. So when he arrived in Ireland, by the way, he got off the train. There's a fine woman there standing in the station with the baby carriage and the little baby in the carriage. And he said, uh, who were you? And she said, um, I'm your mother. He said, how could you be my mother? Well, she said, you know those pills you left lying around the house to make you 50 years younger? But she said, I took one of them and look at me. My God, he said, I can't believe it, you're lovely. He said, who's in the baby carriage? She said, your father, he took two. <laughs> <laughs> Did you enjoy that little session with me, ladies and gentlemen? I love being with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you very much. Oh, that's nice. Now it's time for me to introduce to you my very special guest star. Ladies and gentlemen, Tony Kenny. Thank you, Hal. It seems like only yesterday I sailed from out of Cork. A wonder from old Aaron's Isle I landed in New York Now there wasn't a soul to greet me there A stranger on your shore But your Irish look was with me here And fortune came galore But now I'm going back again To dear old Aaron's Isle Me friends will meet me on the pier And greet me with a smile Well their faces sure I've almost forgot I've been so long away And me mother will introduce them all And this to me will say Shake and your uncle Mike, me boy, and here's your sister Kate And sure there's the girl you used to swing down by the garden gate Shake hands with all the neighbours and kiss the Colleen's all You're as welcome as the flowers in May to dear old Donegal Meet Brannigan, Flanagan, Milligan, Gilligan, Duffy, McCuffy, McCaffey, Mahone Rafferty, Lafferty, Donnelly, Connolly, Dooley, O'Hooley, Muldowney, Malone Madigan, Paddigan, Lanahan, Fanahan, Fagan, O'Hagan, O'Hulahan, Flynn Shanahan, Manahan, Fogarty, Hogarty, Kelly, O'Kelly, McGuinness, McGinn Shake hands with your uncle Mike, me boy, and here's your sister Kate. I should there's the girl you used to swing down by the garden gate. Shake hands with all the neighbours and kiss the Colleen's all. You're as welcome as the flowers in May. To indeed ladies and gentlemen and hello from me now in our audience tonight I know we have many visitors who have been touring our country and perhaps you've been out to the western part where there are some of the most beautiful sights on God's earth and you'll know that it's such a delight to sit down and relax at the end of the day and watch the Sun go down on Galway Bay If you ever go across the sea to Ireland Then maybe at the closing of the day You will sit and watch the moon rise over Cladder and see the sun go down on Galway Bay Just to hear again the ripple of the trout stream The women in the meadows making hay And to sit beside a turf fire in a cabin and watch the barefoot gossoons at their play Oh, the breeze is blowing o'er the seas from Ireland Are perfumed by the heather as they blow And the women in the uplands dig and pray to Speak a language that the strangers do not know 
For the strangers came, they tried to teach us their way. They scorned us just for being what we are. But they might as well go chasing after moonbeams or light a penny candle from a star. And if there is going to be a life hereafter And somehow I feel sure there's going to be I will ask my God to let me make my heaven In that dear land across the Irish Sea. Ladies and gentlemen, the beauty that lies in our heritage of Irish humour is not only uplifting to our people here in the Emerald Isle, but to peoples all over the world for its sheer unpretentiousness and simplicity. Here's an example. Mrs. Hennessy goes to her son's bedroom at 7 o'clock in the morning. She said, Timothy, it is time to get up to go to school. Timothy said, I don't want to go to school. I hate school. All the kids hate me. All the teachers hate me. Even the cleaners in the school hate me. I don't want to go to school. His mother said, you've got to go to school. You're 40 years old and you're the principal. <laughs> this, oh, that's nice. <laughs> I come from Waterford City, by the way, here in Ireland, about 100 miles from here. Now, Waterford, of course, is famous for large families. There was 26 children in our family, by the way, 26. Isn't that wonderful? And we always put my dear mother on a pedestal. We had to, to keep my father away from her. <laughs> Imagine 26 children. There was eight of us in every bed. I never slept alone till I got married. But anyway, that's... They're all explaining that around the room here at the moment. I know you are. I know you are. But anyway, that's, that, that's, that's another story. This fellow Flanagan is driving in his car down a county cock. A policeman on a motorcycle waved him down. He pulled into the side of the road, he put the window of the car down, and the policeman said to him, Did you know your wife fell out of the car about four miles back? Oh, he said, Thank God. I thought I'd gone deaf. <laughs> I'm, she's explaining everything to the other one over here, by the way. <laughs> I was down in County Kerry. And I was passing Shanahan's cottage, by the way, and Shanahan is outside the door with a saw cutting wood and his wife uh, inside the door. I said, how you doing? He said, terrific. I said, how's the wife? Well, he said, not too good. She's very ill. He said, she's got a very bad cold. So I said, is that her coffin? He said, no, I'm building a hen house. <laughs> <laughs> I think we say the rosary and go home, do you know that? <laughs> the phone rings in the hospital, by the way. In the local hospital. The nurse picked up the phone and I said, I'm inquiring about Pat Murphy, who had a very serious operation 10 days ago. I want to know how did the operation go? Was it successful? And if it was, how was he doing? And if he's doing well, when do you think he might be coming home? And the nurse said, hold on. So she disappeared for 10 minutes and came back and said, well, he had his operation, was very serious, but he came through very, very good, by the way and he's recuperating, and if all goes well, he should be home now in about two weeks' time. The nurse said, by the way, who's speaking? He said, this is Pat Murphy. Nobody tells me anything in this place, by the way. <laughs> How often have we wanted to do that ourselves? Isn't that right? We wanted to do it. O'Brien won a few pounds on the races, by the way, and he decided to pamper himself. They just opened a new posh barber shop in Dublin, very exclusive and very expensive. But he didn't care, so he went and he sat in the chair, 
Six different people tending to him and a fine, good-looking woman giving him a manicure. And he said to her, would you like to come out with me tonight? We'll, have a, we'll go dancing, we'll have a bottle of wine, a nice dinner, and we'll go dancing cheek to cheek and then we'll enjoy ourselves. And she said, I'm married. He said, that doesn't matter. You can tell your husband you're going out with your girlfriend. She said, you can tell him yourself, he's shaving you. <laughs> <laughs> You're all having a good time in Ireland, right? Yes, 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 you are. We are a unique people, by the way. Have you ever stopped your car in the country in Ireland and asked directions to some place? Then how did you get here? <laughs> you see, we, 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 oh yeah, don't. Take a chance on your own. You'll be much better off. Now, let me tell you the problem. And if it is a problem, this is it. Now, we Irish love to see our tourists come here. You all look so nice and so healthy and suntanned with the lovely weather we're having here. But you see, if you're down the country and you get lost in your car and you're looking for directions to someplace and you stop one of us, now you're in trouble. You really are, you see. Because we love you so much. And if we don't know the directions to the town you're looking for, we haven't the heart to tell you. Now, that's the problem. And then if you keep talking to us, we panic. And we'll tell you anything to get rid of you. <laughs> anything. I tapped myself down in Galway. I said to the fellow, he was on a tractor. I said, am I on the right road for Galway? He said, you are, but you're going the wrong way. <laughs> but we, we mean well, and we do really love you. We really do. By the way, to digress for a moment, I want you to imagine this now, talking about tourism. There's a fellow walking up Grafton Street uh, Casey, and there's a big card in the window of the travel agency on which is written, and I quote, two weeks in Florida, two pounds. He thought, I don't believe it. He goes in, he said to the man, you mean uh, 2,000 pounds? And I said, no, two pounds, special offer. Oh, he said, I'm going. <laughs> I've never been to Florida, two pounds, put my name down. Pat Casey, I'm going. And the clerk said, very well, this gentleman, by the way, will be accompanying you here. He's going to, his name is Murphy. He said, Mr. Murphy, you're going to Florida. Oh, God, he said, there's marvellous value, two pounds, I'm going. Indeed I am. Just then a giant of a man came out from the back office with a big wooden mallet hammer. Attacked the two of them. Hit them over the head. Knocked them unconscious. They woke up the next afternoon in the middle of the Atlantic in a rowing boat. <laughs> rowing across the Atlantic. Casey said to Murphy, it's a rip-off. <laughs> he said, I hope to God they're going to fly us home. <laughs> and Murphy said, well, they didn't last year. <laughs> <laughs> Write it down, a good one. They laugh at us. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful to be able to laugh like that? This fellow Doolin, by the way, from County Cork. Now, he had a cat, and he loved this cat passionately. The cat was a great part of his life. And one day he said to his brother Mike, I'm off to Dublin for a few days on business, and I want you to take care of the cat for me while I'm gone. And Mike said, I will, I will. <laughs> Three days go by, and he phoned home. He said to Mike, how is the cat? Mike said, the cat is dead. <laughs> Good God, he said, did you have to tell me like that? And Mike said, what other way could I tell you that the cat is dead? He said, I don't know, you could have said anything. You could have broken the news gradually to me. I'm distraught, the cat is gone. You could have, you could have made up something. You could have broken the news gradually to me. You could have said something like, um, the cat was up on the roof, that's it. And the fire brigade was trying to get it down. You could have said that. The next time when I called, you could say something like, they, they were trying to take the cat down and let it fall. And it was badly injured. When it hit the ground, you could have said that, God knows. The next time I called, you could say something like the, um, yeah, the veterinarian doctors tried every way to save the cat, but it was no good. And the cat died. Though he said, had you told me that way, it wouldn't have been such a shock to me. I said, by the way, how was mother? <laughs> and He said, well, she's up on the roof. I...
You have to write that down, you really do. <laughs> Danaher was made mayor of a little town here in County Cork. And all the dignitaries from the other towns came to pay tribute to him. And they gave a dinner in his honour. But Danaher, I'm afraid, the Guinness was flowing to far too freely and he was imbibing far too much because at midnight he was legless and drunk as well. <laughs> and he suddenly heard music beginning to play and he got an irresistible urge to dance. He saw a vision in red standing across the room and he sauntered over and said, would the lovely lady in red care to have this dance with me? And the figure answered, I must refuse for many reasons. Firstly, I can't dance. Secondly, that is not dance which the band is playing. It is the national anthem. <laughs> and thirdly, I am not your lovely lady in red. I'm the Bishop of Galway. <laughs> right it down, for God's sake, before you forget about it. You're lovely. I wish I could be out there with you. I really do. We laugh at ourselves. We're the envy of the world for our ability to do that. What about this one? Three fellas arrive in Dublin from the country here in Ireland to be interviewed for a job. And of course, they're looking for the brightest of the three. Now, the first fellow to go in, he goes in and the clerk said, uh, two and two. He said, um, 37. <laughs> the clerk said, get out. Get out. So the next fellow comes in, he said, two and two. And he said, uh, Wednesday. <laughs> he says, get out. The third fellow comes in, he said, two and two. He said, four. He said, thank God. How did you arrive at that answer? He said, I took 37 from Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I am firmly convinced, by the way, that the reason we have all sorts of trouble and problems in the world today is we do not listen attentively enough to what people are trying to tell us. That is the problem. And my story epitomizes what I mean. Now, this has been marvelous weather, as you know, here in Ireland. And I'm driving in the country with an open car. And this woman passed me in her car. And as she passed me, she went red in the face and glared at me and said, she shouted at me, she did. She said, pig, pig. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> she upset me, she really did. I lacerated her with words. I did, and just then I ran over a pig. We've got problems here. Now, it could happen. This could happen to you as well. I have a farm here in the hills in Dublin, and I have a horse riding when I can. And one morning I met a fellow <laughs> on the horse. I was on the horse, not him. And he said to me, Mr. Roach, I'll do any odd job that needs doing for 20 pounds. And I said, why not? Will you paint my porch? He said, I will. So he went away, got his gear, came back. I said, did you paint the porch? He said, I did. He said, but you're a bit of a comedian and you're trying to fool me. It's not a Porsche, it's a Mercedes. <laughs> <laughs> It could happen. <laughs> you know, you're lovely. Some of the happiest times in my life are spent in the company of children. And I wrote a book called Laugh with the Children of Ireland, by the way, and I enjoyed doing it because uh, children are very special to me. They really are. They brighten up our, our lives. I hope that you read uh, a couple of stories. One of the stories in my book is, and lamentably, this could happen in Ireland today. In the north of Ireland, particularly, a little boy found a bullet in the street, live, and he swallowed it. And he nearly died. So did his mother. And she rushed him to the hospital, and they examined the boy, by the way. And the doctor came out to reassure her. He said, don't worry now, just take the boy home and give him a pint of castor oil. <laughs> and he'll be fine. Uh, she said, doctor, a pint, wouldn't that be dangerous? Uh, he said, no, not unless you point the child at someone. <laughs> Now, this... Go on, think about that now. Go on, go on. Make something out of that one, eh? <laughs> 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 
up at the pearly gates of heaven. There are two... She's still explaining here, now. I'll tell you now, there. <laughs> up at the pearly gates of heaven, by the way, there are... Uh, there's a, this, uh, this fellow standing outside the pearly gates, and St. Peter said, what's your name? He said, Tim Flanagan. And St. Peter said, what do you do on earth? He said, I was in the scrap iron, scrap iron dealer. I deal in scrap iron. And St. Peter said, well, we haven't had one of those in here before. I'll have to check you out. So Sir Peter went away to check him out. <clears throat> and when he got back, the gates were gone. <laughs> I don't believe this. You're beautiful, you really are. There's a rare book collector going around Ireland, by the way, looking for rare books. And he comes to Seamus O'Shaughnessy's cottage and he said, now I'm a rare book collector and I was wondering if you would have any books of that calibre for sale. And Shantis said, no, no, he said, nothing like that at all. Now, he said, wait a minute, my great-grandfather had an old book lying around here for about 80 years. And people said it was worth a lot of money. It was a Bible, an old Bible. It was a Gutten something or other. A good, I said, I can't, a good, the dealer said, not a, <clears throat> not a Gutenberg Bible. He said, the very thing, that was it. He said, you have a Gutenberg Bible? Well, he said, we did have, he said, but uh, we threw it out. <laughs> the dealer nearly died. He said, do you realise the last time a Gutenberg Bible went under the hammer, it fetched 15 million pounds? And O'Shaughnessy said, well, the one I had, it'd be worth nothing. Some fellow called Martin Luther had scribbled all over it. <laughs> 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 Write that down. Father O'Brien, by the way, is walking down the street one day and he met O'Shaughnessy. Now, God help us, it's no secret that we Irish are very fond of a little drop of the crater. Isn't that right? You discovered that since you got here, did you? Uh, we like a little drink. A little of what you fancy does you good, by the way. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But O'Shaughnessy was taking advantage of that and I'm afraid that he was uh, every day at it. And he just comes out of the library and he met Father O'Shea. He said, Father, the very man, he said, can you tell me, what's lumbago? And the priest thought, this is it. This is it. I'll frighten the life out of him. Put him off the booze for good. <laughs> he said, I'll tell you what lumbago is. It's been basically degenerate. Too much wine, women and song, the high life. <laughs> Degeneracy, that's what it is. <laughs> that is what it is. The high life, the women, the drink, the whole bit. Degeneracy personified. That's what La Vega is. Why do you ask? He said, well, I was reading in the paper this morning that the bishop has it. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to tell you this one. There's a train going from Dublin to Killarney and the train is full. The train is about three hours out from Dublin and Casey and Flanagan go through the connecting doors into the carriages of the train. And Casey looked at all the passengers and said, is there a Catholic priest on the train? And they all looked at each other. No, he said, oh, God. God. And they went out. Fifteen minutes later, they came back a little bit more agitated this time and said, is there, a, is, there, is, is, is there a Protestant vicar on the train? And they all looked at each other again. No, he said, oh, God. So they went out. Now, they came in for a third time. And before Casey could open his mouth, this little man stood up and said, I am a Baptist minister. Can I help? And Casey said, you can't help. We're looking for a corkscrew. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so nice. You know, ladies and gentlemen, soon it will be time for me to say good night to you. But I can't tell you how much I have enjoyed being with you this evening. We shared something very special on a fine, close night here in the Emerald Isle. We laughed together for a little while and we forgot about the cares of the day. That's what it's all about. The world needs to laugh today more than any time in its history. One day, laughter will change the world. Mark my words, read my lips. You heard it here. <laughs> Write it down. It will change the world. All nations will realize the humour is an integral part of their heritage and they want to share it. And then this so-called light we're always talking about will appear at the end of the tunnel and we're on our way. We really are. Laughter is the food of the soul. I always say this. 
To laugh is to love, to laugh is to understand. To laugh is to forgive. Now, forgiveness, there's a topic. Forgive somebody. Nothing annoys them more. <laughs> but I tell you... Well, I'm kidding, aren't I? Some of us, by the way, know people who can't say, I'm sorry. I know people like that, so do you. Some people can't say, I forgive. They, th they say things like, I forgive, but I won't forget. That's the same as saying, I can't forgive. Some people you know cannot forgive or say, I'm sorry. And it's very sad. And they carry this burden with them all through their lives. They're crazy. Why would anybody want to do something like that when all you have to say is, I forgive you? It doesn't matter what it was or when it was. Get rid of it. Get rid of it now. Forgive them, if not for your sake, for theirs. Don't carry that around with you, by the way. And your life will change. You'll find some peace within you to enjoy your life and your family. Believe me, it works. It really does. And also, of course, humour plays with our emotions, doesn't it? It has us laughing one moment, and then we have a little tear maybe the next. Casey was in court charge with not supporting his wife. The judge said, after long deliberation, I've decided to award your wife 61 pounds a week. He said, God bless you, Your Honour, and I'll try and send her a few pounds myself as well. Assuming <laughs> I mean, we're laughing again now, right? It's wonderful, isn't it? Wonderful emotion, honest to God, it really is. Now, when I finished last year in uh, Spain, I, here, I went to Spain for the Astor Convention, and I played at the lovely Castellano Hotel in Madrid. And we taped the show, and afterwards, by the way, everybody happy, I went out on the town in Madrid. I had two bottles of cheap Spanish wine that nearly killed me. <laughs> uh, yes, I'll never forget it. And I had a diabolical dinner in some street restaurant. And when I got back, I nearly died. I did. When the plane landed, I rushed to the doctor. Right? He examined me. He said, put your tongue out. And I did. He said, my God, don't put that back in your mouth. You'll poison yourself. <laughs> he said, have you had this before? I said, yes. He said, you've got it again. <laughs> <clears throat> and I lost my voice. I couldn't talk as well. I said, doctor, I can't talk. He said, I can hear that. He says, get into the room and take your clothes off and I'll be in to examine you. I said, it's, it's me throat. He said, don't argue with me, get undressed. Well, you can't argue with the doctor. I went into the room, got undressed. There's a fellow sitting beside me with nothing on but the radio. <laughs> I said, this is lovely. I come here with a sore throat. I finish up with no clothes on. He said, you're lucky. I only came here to tune the piano. 